Welcome to Talking With Tech. My name is Chris Bouguet, and I'm here with Rachel Nadel. Rachel, we went on a little sabbatical for two weeks, and what did you do? Did you go have some fun? Chris, I was in Europe for two weeks. Fantastic. Europe. All right. Tell us all about it. What, what did you learn? What did you see? What did you do? It was amazing. I So I went to uh, Spain and France and was lucky enough to be hanging out with people who were from there. Um, and so I had the experience of kind of more of a local, a local vibe. I was staying, you know, with people who live there and know, you know, what it's like to grow up there and, you know, all of those things. And so, um, yeah, it was really great. I was in Madrid and then I spent some time in the South of France, um, both on the Mediterranean side near Perpignan. If anyone here knows of the South of France or we have any people from France listening to this podcast, um, and then spent some time in the Pyrenees mountains and then ended in Paris and then flew back to LA. Um, but yeah, it was amazing. I had such a great time and I just kind of like had a food tour basically for two weeks through Europe. Oh, that sounds fantastic. I mean, the idea of getting a local vibe is exactly what I would want, my, my, Melissa and I would want to do, right? Like, sure, we'll do all the touristy trap sort of things, but we would love to get some of that local feel. So how did you, what was your connection? Uh, just friends, just friends I have, um, which I feel lucky to have friends that, you know, aren't necessarily from the United States. And I feel like, um, yeah, I was just like, I'm going to be there. And it was great. Did you, um, let me just ask, because here you're in two countries where uh, English is not the primary language. Did you have any insights about language while you were there? You know, I mean, I, I reflect back. One of the reasons I ask is I reflect back into one of the reasons I got into speech language pathology was because I was an exchange student in Finland. And some of the mistakes that people in Finland were making consistently when trying to speak English spurred my curiosity. So I'm curious, did you have any sort of major takeaways when it came to like your profession? Well, I know, I know how to say I am a speech therapist in Spanish, Chris. Yo soy logopedia. <laughs> So um, that was fun. I learned uh, speech therapist in Spanish. Um, and I know a little bit of Spanish. And which ironic, Chris, is that we had the episodes airing um, where I interviewed the group from Bilingue AAC at the same time where I was struggling to both understand and speak Spanish in Spain. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, there were no real takeaways other than I need to be practicing my Spanish more because um, I definitely understand. I can kind of follow a conversation, but um, I, and I had some opportunities to practice, but it's definitely an area that I would love to kind of grow in. Um, I took so many years of Spanish in high school, like grade school and high school and you know, it's just like, if you don't use it, you lose it. And I had the ability to use it there. And in some cases, like was, you know, talking with someone who didn't really speak any English. So I was kind of forced to figure it out. Um, and then when I was in France, it was kind of this like trilingual experience where I was talking, you know, with Spanish and then also French and then English. I, I don't know, hardly, I hardly know any French. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting because the friends that I was with, um, one of them is bilingual Spanish and English. And so that was how we were able to connect with uh, our French friends, parents, because they speak French primarily. They speak more Spanish than they speak English. So it was like this trifecta of languages kind of at the dinner table, just going back and forth. And um, but yeah, it was really it was fun. What about any technology that you might have used uh, in, the, in either in travel wise, you know, sometimes we talk about productivity applications or just stuff to make your life easier from a technology angle. Did you use, I don't know, Microsoft Translator or Google or other tools like that to help you navigate a two foreign countries? Yes, Google Translate was is a girl's best friend and I've definitely used that in the past especially when I'm like oh like I need to figure out this very specific thing that I don't think I don't feel very confident in you know in Spanish but 
I'll try first. And then if you don't understand me, then I will show you <laughs> on Google Translate on my phone, which I feel like is a really good kind of backup strategy. Um, the other feature that I didn't realize about Google Translate is that they actually have a live like um, transcription type of situation where you can actually translate you can speak into it and, you know, there's some errors and things like that. But um, that I feel like is really awesome, too. Um, and since I'm talking about these things, one more thing, which is really cool, is the iPhone now allows you to take a picture of anything and you can scan that picture for text. So if you have a sign or something that you can't read, you take a picture of it and then you're able to highlight the text and then translate the text um, through an iPhone, um, which is awesome. Like think about the technology that we have. I remember like, you know, before when I was like backpacking through Europe, I would have like my big like book on my big travel book of like wherever I was going. And then it would have like this little glossary in the back of like, important words and phrases I would need in that specific language. And now we just like can take a picture with our phone and translate, you know, a sign that we can't read. Well, that is actually a great transition into where I was. Um, I, like I mentioned in last week's episode, I went to the International Society for Technology and Education Conference. But if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that we road tripped down there with the other authors of Inclusive uh, Learning 365. And we were showing off um, different technologies that, that inclusive learning technologies that you could use along the way, including that specifically. We um, th that feature that you mentioned on the iPhone, uh, the scan text feature. So the way we showed it off was here you'd go to a statue, let's say, and there'd be a placard. Or if you've ever been to a park and there's been those placards where there's some sort of uh, description of what's happening, you know, or what happened in this park in history or whatever. Well, you have to have a certain level of reading ability um, to to access that, um, to, to decode that, or to, in some cases, even know it's there, right? And so here we were using our technology to do exactly what you just said. It's like, let's take the phone, let's hover over, open up the camera app, hover over this placard, wait for the little icon to appear on the screen, hit the icon, it'll bring up all the text, and then you can copy it, paste, copy it into your notes app if you want it for later, hit the little play button and have the text read out loud um, so that you, you, uh, whoever, don't feel like you have to decode at the same time as everyone else. Imagine you're on a field trip and you come across and you're uh, learning to decode at a rate different than a friend of yours and they are have decided they're they're done reading or maybe they never even read it in the first place because let's let's be honest, right? Like you, you kind of stare at those placards, but if it's too long, didn't read, you're not, you're looking around and you're ready to move on, right? But here you can save it for later by copy and paste or you can listen to it real quick, which could be like, all right, I'm going to walk away and still listen to the placard rather than stand here and stare at it, you know? Um, so that's the kind of stuff we did in the, on the road trip, which I have to tell you, was so fun. It was so fun to be in the car together. Thank you for everyone who participated and followed along on the hashtag inclusive road to ISTE. Um, we had a Spotify playlist that we just played over and over again. And really, there were some songs we heard multiple times and other songs that we never heard at all, um, which we can, I still listen to that playlist because of all the different people that have added and all the good songs on it. And so it was just uh, a lot of fun um, looks like we both did some traveling over our break. Yeah, I was following along sort of with you, Chris, like when I would pop on social media, I was like, oh my gosh, that looks so fun. Like, you know, all these like like-minded, awesome people in the same car, just trying to make everything accessible and showcase it with the world. I was really uh, having FOMO while I was watching you guys. Yeah, you know, one of the things we're thinking of doing as a sort of a follow-up event to the Inclusive Road to ISTE is either, uh, I should say, that whole thing was sponsored by TextHelp. Um, we probably would not have been able to do the whole road trip if it wasn't for TextHelp supporting us. And um, one of the follow-up things we're thinking of doing is either asking TextHelp, to, if we want to be on their podcast, to talk about the reflections of ISTE, or coming back here on this podcast and just doing our reflections of what we learned at, at ISTE. So uh, either way, we'll put it out on the social media feed. Somehow we're going to reflect on the stuff we learned while we were at ISTE, um, either on the Textile podcast or over here. If that's I okay love that, with. Chris. Yeah. Have the whole crew on. 
I like want to be a part of it, even though I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a way, everybody sort of was, right? Because you could go back and still follow the hashtag, see all the uh, the the images and the posts. Um, still add to the Spotify playlist if you have a, a road trip that you uh, song that you'd like to add or listen to our playlist. You can add it to your own Spotify. Um, so there's still plenty of ways to to participate. It it sort of never ends. And then on top of that, Rachel, what we also did was the scavenger hunt. So we developed this wonderfully inclusive scavenger hunt that uh, at the, so we did it for building up to the conference and then at the conference is where we sort of had the the last kind of wrap up sort of session where um, we had lots of people participate in this scavenger hunt. Uh, we're thinking of doing it again. Uh, it looks like we're going to be going to Indiana in November for the Access to Education Conference and we're going to do it again. So keep um Keep listening to the podcast. Keep following us on social media. If you missed out on the opportunity to participate in the wish in the 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 wonderfully inclusive scavenger hunt for round one, we'll be doing it again uh, in the future. So yeah, keep uh, keep following. Chris, are you going to be driving from Virginia to Indiana in November? Well, never say never, but I don't think so. I think that's going to be a flight in uh, that that road trip. I mean, we would be up for doing something like that again, and maybe someday Rachel, you and I will have some sort of event where we'll it'll make sense to do a road trip from um, together, where we could do something like that. Uh, but right now, no, no plans for uh, for another road trip. Just another scavenger hunt. Awesome. Well, I am excited to see what else you guys come up with. I feel like you're super clever, Chris, and creative when it comes to those things. So um, definitely excited to see what comes down the pipeline. So tell us about part two of your interview with Vicki and Janine. So um, this is part two with Vicki Haddix and Janine Pekka. And Janine is a autistic graduate student uh, that's worked uh, with Vicki and came on the podcast to share her experience uh, being autistic. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the things we talk about in this part of the episode is a presentation that she gave um, that just sounds so unbelievable. I'm not going to spoil it by talking about it here in, in our banter. Um, so definitely you're going to take a listen. But I'll leave it at this. I for sure want to one day see Janine present this because it sounds like such an amazing idea and um, I feel like it's super creative and it's so needed in our field. So without further ado, here's part two with Vicki Haddix and Janine Pekka. If you enjoy talking with tech, we could use your help in spreading the word about the podcast. Please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. The more positive reviews the podcast gets, the easier it becomes for others to find it. The more people who find the podcast, the more the word spreads about how to effectively consider and implement AAC. And who doesn't want that? If that sounds good to you, please take a moment and give the podcast a quick review. We'd so very much appreciate it. Now, let's get back into the episode. And then I'm curious too, how has your, how has your journey kind of unfolded with trying to, you know, integrate, I guess, into a new community that like you perhaps like didn't even know about before and now, you know, have access to like, what has that journey been like? Oh yeah. It's, it's very interesting. Um, so I've definitely since being diagnosed, I've met other people on the spectrum and be, have become friends with them. Um, mostly adults, mostly women as well, just because being someone who identifies as a woman, it, I typically meet other women. Um, so, you know, that's been great, you know, and I have a lot of close friends, you know, along that continuum, but it's also, it's kind of limiting because I haven't met ironically as many men with autism, you know, mm -hmm. who are running in my circle. So I don't get a chance to connect with them to the same extent, um, mm -hmm. which is going to skew, you know, my perspective and understanding of the community, because again, women typically do present differently than, than males on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked a lot with kids on the spectrum since being a, a graduate student, which has been great because uh, the clinical faculty here have been awesome about me kind of forming my own understanding of that client's autism and kind of picking up on things that 
are very relevant to me and I see, and I definitely notice, and I'll bring up that sometimes my clinical faculty member didn't consider, wasn't very focused on. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's been a great dialogue to have too. That's also been really validating, you know, to bring up like, well, you know, I, I see little Jimmy here, you know, is doing this when I do this. And I wonder if that has a sensory component to it. You know, I wonder if they're something is going off in their mind, like this is a bad sensation and I need to run away. And because of the nature of like the equipment we're using or like, you know, the therapy toy or whatever's going on, you know, maybe we can change something in the environment to take that stimuli out there and then see if that is like an underlying issue that this child's having. And that's, that's been really great to kind of, from an insider perspective, figure out how to tweak therapy to, you know, the most efficient, effective, and neuroaffirming, um, you know, way that we can. And as a supervisor, I can just say it was lovely to have Janine <laughs> with my client and I did not have to sit there and explain all of <laughs> that kind yeah. of stuff. It's like, she just intuitively understood that. So like it worked, <laughs> it was, it was a, she developed a rapport with this, um, with this young man much faster than any of the other clinical students have because, and I, again, did not have to sit there and explain <laughs> any of that. It just, she just got it. So. Yeah. And it feels like, you know, what a valuable resource to all of the clinicians and pre-service SLPs, right. Is just like having that unique perspective. Um, and what's awesome, Janine, is that you're going to be able to take that in all the work that you do <laughs> and sitting in IEP meetings and with families and really having that insider look into, you know, what, what autism can look like and it can look very differently. Um, so I just feel like that's so valuable. Um, it you know, is. to, Go ahead. And we need to share your communication board. I'll that. <laughs> uh, yeah, as one of the uh, assignments for Vicky's class, we all had to create a personal communication board and use it after we were trained in like what AC is and how to use it and how to make a good board. And mine was basically an overstimulation board because <laughs> wow. at first I get overstimulated sometimes and the way it presents for me, it's very hard for me to access language when that happens mm -hmm. or the language that I have access to is extremely, you know, like day-to-day -day, like automatic scripts and it's not as nuanced as I'd like it to be. So I actually created a little like I want, I need sort of style board with all sorts of sensory based things. So like I need the lights off, I need my dog, <laughs> I need all of these things. So that, you know, if I'm, I'm in the house with somebody else, you know, I can go up to them and potentially ask them for, um, you know, what my needs are to kind of help take the pressure off of me to meet those sensory needs when I'm at that point. Uh, so that was, that was really awesome. <laughs> I love that activity, Vicki. So <laughs> great job. And also I love Janine, what you chose. Um, I feel like I keep trying to like drive this point home in every IEP meeting that I'm sitting in with every family. Like if we know there's a diagnosis of autism, why are we not supporting sensory strategies through AAC? Why are we not creating folders and integrating this into a child's everyday life, not just when they become dysregulated, we like whip out some choice board or whatever. It's like, we need to be teaching, you know, students how to access this language. Because like you said it yourself, Janine, like when I'm dysregulated, I don't have access to my language. Um, you know, we we're hearing this from autistic adults, you know, and we really need to inform our practice. It needs to be a top priority, I feel like, um, from the initial stages. And oftentimes when you're working with students, uh, autistic students, they, you know, it's like, oh, they're not working or they're stimming on the device and the AAC isn't working. And it's like, start with sensory, like start with helping that child get regulated and communicating about what kinds of things they'd like in order to become regulated. We know like a lot of times kids are super motivated by these sensory things. Um, and so it's just like, it feels like an easy, like aha thing that we should all be doing as clinicians. Um, and I'm happy that you brought that up, Janine, because it feels like, <laughs> yep, I'm not surprised that like, you know, hearing your experience about needing that type of sensory language to advocate for your needs. And it's, it's so important, especially when talking to people like of the neuro majority, one of the projects I took on um, this past year was essentially a, a basic like intro to neuroaffirming care um, presentation uh, that I presented at our Mid-South Conference on Communication Sciences and Disorders here in Memphis. And I also just presented for a local um, a therapy group in the area yesterday, actually, it was really great. And 
that that essentially encompasses everything that I've learned here um, and all of my own experience. And there are three sorts of arcs to the presentation. So the first one is just approaches to disability, talking about medical model versus social model, social relational model, all those things, because not everyone realizes that how we even view disability or differences is going to have that underlying implicit bias that is very much shaped by those frameworks and how powerful those frameworks can be even presenting the idea to parents. I know in the autism evaluations that are done at my university, the clinicians who do the score reporting to the parents talk about frameworks of disability and how sometimes, you know, we can think about it like a, a mismatch between society um, and, and the, the disorder. And it's not just, you know, here's the stuff that's medically wrong with you and here are the band-aids we can put on it. That's not, that's not what autism is going to be. Um, the second arc of the presentation, which is my favorite, is overstimulating. Yes. <laughs> you are not autistic. <laughs> I think you're shaking your head. Uh, All right, I have my own sensory is... issues and I could not sit through that part of the presentation. <laughs> I had to leave. I came back. <laughs> I, I saw the third part, but I, I had to excuse myself for the second. And it is, it is absolutely meant to be overstimulating. So I do make it very clear that people who wish to leave the room are more than welcome to do so. But essentially the, the presentation goes to a dark place. There is colorful flashing lights on every screen. Um, there are two sound files that I have. One is like your basic cafe chatter. The other one is like the top 10 most annoying noises on a loop. Um, these are played at a good volume so that they're competing with my voice. The words on the screen are not written left to right. They're not spelled in the right order per se. And every screen, the way that the text is, is laid out different because if there's one thing non-autistic people do very well, it's adapt to sensory stimuli. So we have to keep them guessing and moving. I also have all the participants stand on one leg and I have them cross their arms and pat their shoulders. And then I proceed to run like a mock classroom as a teacher who is not very well uh, informed on neuro diversity or neuro affirming uh, strategies. So I will, I will call on people, you know, for answers. They'll probably raise their hand. I'll tell them, no, 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 no. We jump up and down. That's what's socially expected. Oh, you must be one of the low functioning autistic people. You know, those kinds of things, those words that don't feel good to hear because you're trying really hard and you're dealing with a lot of stimulation yeah. uh, for the, the individuals who are participating, who are doing really well, I'll call them high functioning and I'll expect them to have answers. And then after a certain time where they're doing really well, I'll say, I don't even think you have autism. I don't think you need any accommodations because these are real things that these are microaggressions that I faced as an autistic person and, and many other people have faced. And then in the third part of the presentation, we talk about everything that was wrong in the second part and how to do better. And we, we talk about those terms like high functioning, low functioning, even the term meltdown, um, which I'm very passionate about not using because at least for me, when I get very sensory overwhelmed, the world becomes a very scary place. Mm -hmm. Everything feels very bad, very hurtful, very aggressive, very much like it's attacking you. Mm -hmm. And if you feel attacked by your sensory environment, what would be the logical thing for anyone to do? It would be run away. It would be mm -hmm. get out of there. Um, it's quickly and as fast as possible. You know, that self-preservation really kicks in. And the words meltdown and tantrum tend to have such a... That's stereotypical, like I'm doing it for attention or it's not absolutely needed and required by my body and need for self-preservation at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so we talk about a lot of terms like that. And we talk, we make it very personal about your experience in the simulation and what that would translate to loosely in, in autism land. So if you, you know, had to leave the room, you eloped. You just avoided the sensory stimulation entirely. <laughs> Vicky eloped, Vicky eloped. <laughs> exactly. If you, you know, put your arms at your side, you didn't want to tap your hands on your shoulders or you couldn't keep them up. That was hand flapping. If you had to put your foot down, um, sit in the chair, that's rocking back and forth. If you made eye contact with me, cause I'll remind people eye contact is not socially appropriate in this context. You know, you, you looked away if you giggled or laughed cause you were nervous. Um, you had an appropriate affect at that moment. You know, if you, um, wanted it to end, you were non-compliant, you know, all, all of these things to make it very personal so that people who don't have to deal with overstimulation on a day-to-day -day basis or on a, on an intermittent basis, at least they can, 
very much understand very easily how this random set of arbitrary rules doesn't necessarily just perfectly make sense at first grant glance. Um, even with instruction that this is the way, this is what's expected of you. It doesn't necessarily poof and make sense suddenly. Um, and that upkeeping whatever those social norms are is physically exhausting and mentally exhausting. And it really competes with your ability to sit in my classroom and learn um, about the topic from me. Um, and it's, it's been very powerful for a lot of people. I've had a lot of great feedback on it and I'm hoping to present it again more in the future. <laughs> Torture more I, innocent <laughs> I have a feeling that we're you're going to get a lot of presentation requests after this podcast. So I hope you're ready to change change a lot of minds and a lot of perspectives, Janine, because I just love everything about what you have just shared. And I hope one day that I'm able to sit in that presentation. Hopefully I won't be as overstimulated as Vicky. Um, but I just I feel like it's really important to like really like examine like this is what this is what we're doing when we're using using these terms and this language and have these expectations. And it's just like, it's traumatizing in a lot of ways. And I feel like having, there's no better way to teach than to have people experience it. And like you said, Janine, make it personal. Um, and so I just love that experience. And I am super impressed with your ability to kind of cur <laughs> curate an experience for people to really make an impact on the way that they think. And I'm, I have no doubt that the people that left that presentation are thinking differently and acting differently now because of your presentation. Well, I, I hope that it definitely made an impact. It's a lot of fun to do just because, um, I, I don't think people get it in that way without oh. experiencing it in that way. Another thing that I'll, I'll bring up that kind of went off a comment that you made, um, you know, about like presenting to like the clients and the families themselves is something that I know I've talked extensively with Vicky <laughs> is that your client can hear you. And yes. this is not just with the clients, any client, they can hear you. And even if they're very young, even if they're nonverbal, they might have an expressive or a receptive vocabulary that is well above their age. And we just don't have a way to tap into that. So even using these terms in front of the child, or, you know, talking as if they're, they're not there or, you know, saying things that very much, you know, label them as disordered and, and incorrect in some way, they're going to hear that. And there is no way that we can be sure that they understand it or not. And we can't be sure how it's shaping them internally. So just giving them, you know, their their due needs as a human being is so critical and talking just about like, Oh my goodness. You no, know, I see, I see that you're doing a lot of hand flapping. I wonder if you're, you know, feeling a lot of stimulation. Let's see, how can I help, you know, and just going through things you can do a therapy session with the lights off. I do homework with the lights off. Everybody thinks I'm ruining my eyes. I can't do it with it on <laughs> light bulbs, make a noise. <laughs> it's annoying. <laughs> it's distracting. I'd rather do the work with very dim light. <laughs> Yeah. I, I remember my mom always coming in being like, why aren't the lights on? You need brighter <laughs> lights to do your homework. I'm like, leave me alone. Like if I needed brighter lights, I would have gotten brighter lights. <laughs> and also when I had the student who was so, she had to write absolutely everything down. And I was like, you are ruining your relationship with the client by pausing to take data every five seconds. <laughs> um, uh, she did a, I, um, uh, conspired with the client um, and he uh, they did a scavenger hunt with a flashlight so of course the lights had to be off and she couldn't take copious <laughs> notes and guess what <laughs> I guess you figured out how to develop a relationship that day <laughs> so yes love that very love useful that. At times. <laughs> clever, clever, Vicky. Um, I'm curious, Vicky, I know we had kind of, I had asked that question in the initial stages, but you know, how did you use your experience with Janine as a way to either change or adapt the things that you were doing, um, with the work that you did with in the graduate program? Um, so, uh, well, prior to Janine entering our program, I had read the fantastic, fantastic article by Alyssa Hillary, who's been on, I think she's been on a couple Twice. times. Um, yes. Uh, they wrote a great article um, on Am I the Curriculum, where they talked about their experience in an AAC class, which was interesting. So I um, absolutely wasn't 
as I designed the AAC class, totally took their article into consideration. And um, so having the experience of teaching someone who um, this was relevant to in a number of different ways um, was not necessarily something brand, was not a brand new idea to me, mm-hmm. which I think mm-hmm. was helpful. <laughs> um, and also I had kind of bought into the UDL thing quite a while ago. So um, mostly it was kind of a, when we had the initial discussion back in January about what accommodations were needed. And she's like, oh, I don't think I need any of these. <laughs> like, it's all built in. And I was like, yes. Score, so, I did it. <laughs> yes. So like achievement unlocked here. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, so a lot of it is about giving choices whenever possible. Um, and it's really thinking about the, the how do I help them navigate through this experience and getting what they need, but also um, figuring out what's interesting to them. Um, so the final, yeah, getting, the, having them choose their own final projects is I think the cornerstone of that. Um, and they, I still need to write up the semesters one for practical AC, but they, they all delivered such fantastic projects this semester. Um, and they had the choice of, of different things because the semester was weird. And it's the first time it's been back in person in a couple of years <laughs> after having been online. Um, that I had them, they could earn up to 115 points, but they only had to earn 100, which I thought I made clear, but. <laughs> but everything's so interesting. How do you not do all the things? How do you not uh, strive for 115, Vicki? <laughs> Yes. Well, almost everybody got 115 points. <laughs> so, um, like, no, really, you could stop at 100. It's fine. But no, everybody kept going. So that was also kind of validating. Like, <laughs> you had choices, but you chose to do a lot more than you needed. So I think that was cool. I definitely felt like your range of choices there. Like, I know you brought up earlier how when you need to do that, like one email fix to everything that is AAC, <laughs> you include, you know, like the written, the podcast, the, the webinar, we, we had choices on, you know, which of them, you know, we wanted to watch and we had to, you know, do a certain number of those and then write like a reflection on it to demonstrate our understanding, those kinds of things. When we read a chapter, we would be able to kind of write a reflection on that about something that, you know, resonated with us, which is an awesome way to teach an AAC class because, that being my one of the last courses that I took in my program, I saw individuals who used AAC. I was very fortunate to have AAC-based treatment and diagnostic placements, actually. I was very much spoiled in the AAC world. Um, and I also definitely had clients that I was like, this person needs AAC, definitely needs AAC or might benefit from AAC. You know, we'll see. So I could take what I was being given as options and pick something for that, you know, that one client I had as a first year, and I really didn't know what to do with, and, oh, maybe this would be good, you know, or I actually don't know how to be more, you know, racially diverse, friendly with AAC, so let me, you know, watch that podcast, you know, listen to that webinar on how to, you know, choose icons that are more appropriate and will resonate more with that client. So I got to learn about things that did very much interested me. And then I also got access to resources where I know that suddenly if I need to work with the dysphagia and AAC, that I can go here and there'll be something on dysphagia and AAC <laughs> for when that comes up, you know, at some point in my career, if it does. Um, so it was a really effective way to teach the course. Thank you. <laughs> got it work for you. <laughs> Well, and I feel like if we try to think about why is it effective, not just in the moment, but also long term is because you're setting up SLPs for inevitably what will happen throughout their career, which is I'm only going to learn about the things I'm interested in, right? Like if I, or, or I'm going to be forced into a corner because like I have a client or, but now I have an arsenal of resources so that I'm able to figure out exactly the information I need and how to get it. Um, and you know, I just feel like not only can they learn in the moment with you, but you've also taught them how to continue learning. And I think that we know AAC especially is ever changing and evolving. There's more to know than we could ever possibly know as one human being. Um, So where do we go to get the information? How do we reflect on that information? Um, And how do we think more big picture? Um, I think a lot of AAC becomes the technical details of the systems and, you know, all this information that's like, 
I always tell families, I'm like, this is a quick Google search. Just like ask, ask your question and put in the device name and like you will find some type of YouTube video that teaches you how to add a button or link to your Google Drive or whatever it might be. It's like what we need to be teaching SLPs is the clinical decision making. Like how do we help talk with families about this? How do we get buy in? How do we, you know, learn about um, diversity and, you know, listen to autistic adults and AAC users themselves? And like, where do we find those resources? And I feel like that's kind of exactly what you've done. Yeah, I very intentionally decided not to teach it as a like technical course. Yes. Um, because it's just, it's not a, I didn't feel like it was a good use of time. And like you said, those are very Googleable searches. <laughs> like yeah. that's not, that's not something I really feel like I need to teach you. I mean, I assume you didn't get to grad school without <laughs> being able to use Google. So <laughs> like that's a, you should be able to do that. So it's all of the other stuff that I want to have conversations about and opening the discussions boards in the class where you have to respond to each other. I think you also learned because not so much the responses as it was reading each other's perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the important part there. Yeah. And then also as a student who took the class, I feel very empowered going forward. I don't know everything about AAC and I got a long way to go yet, just as everybody in the AAC world has to do, as you said, it's too much for one human to... Uh, to know. Um, but it was just, it was really great not to just sit down and get like lectured every week on like, we're going to talk about look well this week. And then we're going to talk about, you know, the, the different systems itself. It was presented much more in like, here is Proloquo. Who would this be good for? Like when you look at this new system that is brand new off the market, never been heard before, whatever, going to be invented in 20, whatever. How, how do you know? How do you make a decision? Who is this good for? Why is it good? What are the pros and the cons of it? And that's what I feel like I was taught. Like I can sit down in front of a system that I've never heard before and I can press the buttons and play around with it and be like, oh, okay. So maybe this is more context dependent, or maybe this is somebody who is much more just independent in general, you know, with their communication. This is good for emerging, or I would doctor this and I would remove this many symbols and I would keep it very core focus for an emergent communicator. Those kinds of decisions, which really do outweigh the, so we have 40 million types of AAC out there. <laughs> Let's go into each one in detail and then get tested on each one. That's not going to be effective. <laughs> Right. And like you, you just detailed what we do in the field when there's a new <laughs> app on the market is like, okay, let me use my clinical decision-making skills to figure out one, is this good <laughs> Two, like, you know, what features are really great about this specific tool that I can help, you know, when I'm deciding what, you know, a student needs as far as, you know, AAC. Um, so I love not making it super device specific and more just like, how do we judge whether or not this is a good option and who is this good for? I love that. Yeah. I also hate giving tests and I don't really <laughs> love reading lots of papers. So <laughs> having more hands-on things and discussion-based things, much better. Win, win. Yes. <laughs> Win, win. Okay. You guys, this has been amazing. Thank you for sharing your experiences for people who are listening, who are like, I need more from Vicki and Janine. How do people get in touch with you? Um, so Twitter is actually a really good way to, and I can't believe I've never mentioned, um, well, we talked about AT chat earlier, but Twitter has also been really instrumental in, in connecting with AAC people. Um, especially if you're feeling kind of isolated and like the only one doing what you're doing in an area, Twitter can be really great for that. And let's face it, there aren't enough of us AAC people out there. Um, and the building community is great. Um, so I am at the, uh, Vicki Boston SLP. Twitter. We'll put it in the show. We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> um, and yeah, I never changed it from, I started the Twitter in Boston and haven't changed it since I moved to Memphis, but, um, and then my uh, email for Memphis is just vhaddix at memphis.edu. Um, and I'm more than happy to respond to lots of, I respond to lots of emails. So, um, but Twitter is much more fun. Come talk with me there. Yeah. Come tweet at me on Twitter. I'm a, I'm a Twitter person now, sort of. <laughs> we follow each other on Twitter. I'm not as active as I want to be, but I'm getting there. Yeah. I, I sort of have an Instagram, but I, it's been probably six months since I've been on there. There are too many pictures. I get overstimulated. <laughs> Twitter is better like for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We choose our social media based on our preferences and our learning styles. Yep. I love it. Yep. How about you, Janine? So my preference is no social media. <laughs> totally fine. 
<laughs> email is the best way to reach me. Um, my personal email is Janine, J-A-N-I-N-E, Pekka, P-E-C-A at gmail.com. No spaces, underscores, or any of that stuff, just my name. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about, you know, my autism experience, my experience as an autistic SLP in grad school, or any questions about the simulation that I discussed, I'm more than happy to answer them. I love it, you guys. Uh, Vicky, you have something else? Her presentation is great, even <laughs> if I had to leave for the middle part of it. But <laughs> I've heard great things. <laughs> and yes. the rest of it, I can vouch for being wonderful. <laughs> I have no doubt that that presentation is really powerful. So I would love to hopefully see it one day. Hopefully you decide to put in some proposals at some, some conferences, Janine, and I would love to be able to, to learn from you. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners would too. So um, thank you guys so much for your experience and sharing it so openly on this podcast. Um, I'm super excited for this episode. I feel like it's really um really going to help a lot of people. And like I said, Vicki, there's a lot of clinical supervisors and clinical, you know, professors who listen to this podcast. And I think we can all help, you know, cultivate a, a really great experience for pre-service SLPs in the AAC realm. Um, and a lot of the things we talked about are just good takeaways, you know, just good takeaways for learning and teaching. And there's just so much overlap there. Um, so I'm really excited that you were able to share your perspective. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course. So for Talking With Tech, I'm Rachel Madel, joined today by Vicki Haddix and Janine Pekka. Thank you guys so much for listening and we'll talk to you guys next week.